Hello and welcome to Console Cowboys. If you're liking this series, let me know in the comments below and share it out with your friends. It really helps out the channel. So in the last video, we got what you see here on the screen, which is we searched the internal transactions, looking for the totals that were in each contract and then the total of all contracts. Now we did that with the internal transactions, which are the result of smart contract logic triggering a transaction. In this one, we're gonna take a look at the normal transactions, which is when a user initiates a transaction. So it's a little bit different. And the idea would be to see, you know, if the attacker is initiating withdrawals out, taking money, sending them other places, what other addresses does that attacker own, or anything else we can kind of glimpse from that. So let's take a look at the API because that'll tell us how to work with regular transactions instead of internal transactions. You'll remember for the internal transactions, our action was TX list internal. So if we look at the documentation for the API, you'll notice that to get a list of normal transactions by address, what we can do is use TX list. Now, considering these are both transactions, they should be similar in how they work. So I would assume that if we just remove this internal part and we do TX list as in the API, it should work the same and give us the totals of all transactions and the total of all transactions across all addresses, but this time with the normal transactions instead of the internal transactions, which would be the user initiated. So let's give that a try. I'm gonna save this and open the terminal back up here. And we're just gonna run this again. And I just created a new file for this, but it's the same code you were working with before. We're just gonna work right off of that, but I named mine find external accounts. And what you'll notice here is we have 0000.0. So that one's a little bit different. And that could be because it's uh, cutting off some of the change there because what you'll remember is we did this uh, divided by and we're only getting two zeros after um, the decimal point. And it may be just that there's less money being sent or utilized within that transaction than we're able to display. Um, like I said, it's not an accurate way to do it. There's probably a better way to do it, but for our purposes, it doesn't matter. So now let's just try to print out where all of these are going to. So I'm going to say, paste a new print statement in here. And what we're gonna say is, we're going to print out down here the last address. It's gonna go through the loop. And on the next address, it's gonna print out sending to next to each transaction that it gets that has a to field, right? So if we look at the API, and we were to hit go into your browser here and look, you'll see that there's the from field, there's a to field, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna grab the to field from any of these. In this case, there's nothing on this to field, but our transaction should have some. So let's do that now. And let's print out. So we got nothing, nothing. And then we have five transactions sending to our guy right here. And it's before that, just based on the order it happens, right? So we go through the loop. After we print out the stuff from the last address, we print out that address, and then we print out all the new stuff, and then we print out the address we just printed that stuff from. So one thing we'll notice is that this one has five transactions. So let's print out the values of each of those transactions. So let's do copy. I'm going to paste this in here. And this time again, simple print statement. We're just saying a little bit of space. Then we're going to do dash with the word amount. And then we're going to do transaction.get value exactly like we did up here. And we're going to loop through and get the value and actually print them out for each transaction from that address. So now what we should get is nothing on those. And then we get sending to amount none, amount none, amount none. So that's interesting. So that gave us 0.0, .0 because it's a none versus actually sending out nothing apparently, which is pretty interesting. We could keep printing out more values on here, but I would say this is significantly 
interesting enough to just take a look on Etherscan right now and see what's going on with all of these transactions that are none amounts. So let's open up Etherscan with the value here of the contract address, or rather the address, it's not a contract. I always misstate that, so my bad. So let's take a look, I'll print that in here. And what we have here is our address, which holds our 12 ether. We have our smart contract initiated internal addresses, which added up to the value of our contract, if you remember. And then we have our regular transactions here, and you'll see the five transactions. These are initiated by a user. They are from a 5D63, 5D63, so it looks like they're all coming from the same address. We could take a look at this address really quick. This is also not a contract, it's just an address that can hold regular ERC-20, ERC-721 tokens, et cetera, but there's no contract code. And it looks like a lot of transactions are going on here. This could be an attacker-owned thing, but we're not quite sure, but it's something else we could look at later on. If I go back and take a look at one of the transactions that are in our transaction list, we'll see our from, we'll see our to, we already took a look at those. We have 0.0, .0 value, so that matches right up with what we were seeing um, within our output here. You know, none and 0.0, .0 for the total value of everything, so that, that matches up, right? So we're not going crazy, it actually is a zero value transaction. And there's not much else in here, but we can hit this click to see more and get a look at the input data. So if you watch like the smart contract hacking series, we took apart some of these, you'll be seeing like uh, different functions in here sometimes and the values that go into the functions. In this case, we're just getting this random bytecode value. We can try to change the type and see if we can get something out of this not really showing us anything. Um, so what we can do here is we can actually look up this bytecode value. If it's in the database, it will tell us what it's associated to. And that is right here. This is the, it's four, as in the number four, B-Y-T-E dot directory. And that's the address to go to this URL. And if we look this up here, uh, we'll see that this is a withdrawal function. That's what this byte signature actually says. So that's interesting considering this is not a contract. It really shouldn't have a withdrawal function. It's just a address with ERC 20s. And if you look at like say uh, ERC 20 contract, maybe we were looking up a uh, ERC 20 contract. If we go to say the open Zeppelin, which is like a secure implementation of that, and we were to search in here for with draw, oh, there is no function, it's just making noise at me. There is a transfer function for ERC20 tokens. So if I do that and search down transfer open bracket, we do have a transfer function, which makes sense for what we were seeing an ether scan, right? This was a transfer function. However, it has this star here because it really isn't a transfer function. I think that just maybe means it couldn't totally figure it out. Ended up just being a withdraw function. So that's interesting. What we could also do to verify some stuff is, so we says in here this signature database, which by the way, the signature database is useful because you could find out the signature that you need for specific functionality within um, the Ethereum network. And when you're searching transactions online, you can look for certain signatures to see when certain events are triggering, which could be useful depending on what type of operations you're doing. Maybe you're doing some kind of intrusion detection type of thing or correlating some kind of attacks or what have you. Might be useful to use this signature database in certain cases, just to give you a couple ideas. But let's actually just search for that. We'll see if we can find other instances on here. So we have online solidity decompiler. So that's interesting. We could check out that. And if we do a search in here and paste that value again, right here, it highlighted it. It is a withdrawal function. We can cruise on down to that. We see else if this do withdrawal, and if I cruise down this withdrawal here, 
It says temp to address this dot balance. So maybe they're trying to grab a this dot balance. Not sure. We'd have to read through and understand this code. Might be worth it. You can also see some disassembly down here if you want to go into that detail. So that's interesting. That just kind of verifies what we were seeing in the signature database that maybe it's some kind of withdrawal operation. We just don't quite know what it's doing because again, um, what we're looking at here is two addresses. These are not contracts. There is no withdrawal function. Um, if you know what's going on here, please feel free to chime in below in the chat because maybe you know something that I don't. I am not an Ethereum developer, but I would assume these wouldn't have withdrawal functions. But let's keep searching around for this and see what else we can find. So we have a Etherscan link here and that actually has a from and a to, and this is actually to a contract. So we could take a look at what this contract has. Maybe it has a similar function. If we go to contract, uh, it's actually just byte code. There is no actual contract code. That's no problem. Another thing that you can do when you're looking at stuff on the blockchain is there's now a decompile bytecode button, which wasn't here before. It's experimental. You can actually hit that and it will say it's experimental and there's a decompile bytecode button. Now, if you haven't decompiled this before, it might tell you something like, hey, you know, we haven't decompiled this particular code before, so you may need to refresh this in 30 seconds and once you do, it'll work. If it doesn't work for you, you might be because you're using Firefox. Sometimes that'll toss errors, but I got errors when I was using it within Firefox. Works fine in Chrome though, or right here I'm using Brave. Works fine in Brave. Now, if we cruise down through here, there is a withdraw function. So maybe this is a similar withdraw function to you know what this guy was trying to call. Um, and again, we see a value eth.valance this dot address. So maybe they're trying to take all the value out of this address to somewhere else. I'm not really 100% sure because again, you know, this is coming from two addresses, not a contract. And I wouldn't think there would be a withdraw function. If I'm wrong, please comment below and let me know what's going on there. I find it kind of interesting that we have this withdrawal function being sent within our transactions here, but that these are actually just two addresses. They are not contracts. I want to do one more thing, which is see if we can use the API to grab the extra data from this section to print out so we can get an idea if there's input data when we do see those none values. Now, right here, it says it's input data, but what we want to do is we want to check what's coming back from the API. So if we open this up in our browser again, this is just the canned stuff that's coming back from whatever a inputted. What we want to do is we want to change this, add in your API token, then add in the address that we are actually working with here. And when you do that, you get back our five transactions. Now in our five transactions, you'll see there's a input data, which matches what we had. There is a method ID, which matches what we had. And then there's a function name. And that function name actually was decoded and gave us the withdrawal. So what we can do is we can print out the function name as well as say the method ID to get an idea of the encoded and decoded bytecode value. So let's add that into our code just as a final thing. So we work with the API a little bit more based on what we were seeing. That way, if there was a bunch of different transactions and they were showing us odd results, we could kind of compare the different types of transactions we're seeing and the method calls that we're seeing. So let's paste in some code here and take a look at that. Let's just add that right below where we had some other code. We'll say right under the value here. Oh, Visual Studio Code is trying to do something crazy. Here we go. Print. What we're going to do is we're going to say print method ID and we'll grab the method ID from the transaction. And then we'll say equals equals and we'll grab the transaction function name to show that that value equals that function being sent with this transaction. So let's give that a try and see what that looks like. All right, so here we have sending two, and that's the contract that we saw of the attackers. There is an amount of none, and it's the method ID of the one we search, and that equal equals the withdrawal function. However, if we start looking at this, and I didn't notice this before, we actually have withdrawal, withdrawal, and we have start. 
And that's kind of the purpose of automating this with code because we can't see things individually as well, but when we print them out, we get more info. So this actually has a method ID of BE9A6555. So if we were to look that up in that database again, it should bring startup. So let's grab the online, let's see, where is it here? We could search for that new one, should bring us back start, and it did. So that's a, another signature that was found. My guess is, you know, Etherscan is referencing this to pull down that data. So as you'll see, like I didn't even see that when I was looking at it earlier. So it's kind of neat that it saw that when I just automated that. Now, if we're looking through that, it said the second to last. So depending what order this is going in, uh, nope, that's the other one. So it might be the second from the first because it might be doing in reverse order. And it is, here's a different one right here. Okay, cool, that is probably where we'll wrap up this video and then we'll wait and see if the attacker does something else. If not, maybe we'll dig into something else within this series, I'm not really sure. For right now, we kind of exhausted a lot of the things based on what we were given. Just to recap what we did in this video, we looked a little closer at the Etherscan API and took a look at user-initiated transactions this time. Then we took the values we saw in the input data, we plug those into the signature database to see that it was a withdraw function. We then, just for fun, looked up that signature, found some bytecode on a contract using that signature. We decompiled that to show how that worked and took a look at what may be a similar function, may not be a similar function. The whole point was you decompiled a you know bytecode that is live on the blockchain when you didn't have code available to you, valuable skill. And then we printed out those input datas next to the functions that I assume Etherscan is pulling from the same symbolic database we were using. And we noticed, hey, there's another function being used we didn't even see before, which was the start function. So as you print out data and you put them next to each other, you can see those differences, notice trends, all of those things, and make better decisions so hopefully this is all useful for you. If it is, share it out with your friends. I really appreciate comments and the likes and, and getting my channel out there. Thumbs up to all you guys, and I will catch you later.